Welcome everyone to this edition of Verifiability Talk. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jan Oliver Ringer. Jan is someone who has uh, a lot of experience with mobile-based engineering, uh, with uh, the automotive domain, but also in, in other domains. And also in recent years, he has been working on synthesis uh, from Tempo Logica specifications. And I guess today he will be talking exactly about that topic. Jan, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation and the floor is yours. This meeting is being recorded. If you don't want your name to appear in the YouTube uh, presentation that we'll uh, upload later on, you could always join us using um, using a different login than your usual uh, Teams login, and hopefully that will uh, make you anonymous in, in the YouTube video. Thank you very much again uh, to all of you and to Yan, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, so uh, today's talk is about Syntech, uh, Synthesis Technologies for Reactive Systems Software Engineers. And um, yeah, I'm now at King's College, but a long time ago, I was also at Tel Aviv University, and this is joint work with Shaha Maus from Tel Aviv University. And uh, this basically, I think five or six years ago, he received this uh, ERC starting grant, which was called Syntech. And now this is an overview of the work that we have done and a little bit what lies ahead because the work is far from far from over. <laughs> so yeah, first we need to have a look what is reactive synthesis all about. So first, maybe what are reactive systems, the kind of systems we're talking about. Um, so reactive systems are continuously stimulated by the external environment and their role is to continuously respond to the stimuli. This is a very old, um, characterization by David Terrell and Amir Pnoeli. And basically these kind of systems, they have sensors that they use to learn something about the environment, to measure things. And then they have actuators that they use to influence the environment. So this can be robots or uh, maybe autonomous forklifts or even a washing machine is a reactive system in, in some sense. And the very important thing about reactive systems is that they are not just starting with one input, then giving one output as the computation, and that's it. But uh, we usually, when we describe their behavior, we describe their behavior over time and usually characterize them using infinite runs. So, um, and despite the, the advances in, let's say, iterative development processes and automated testing and verification, this behavior over time is still really difficult to implement correctly. Um, and now if we look at a very, very simplified overview of a typical development approach, you would come up with some form of implementation, then you would have some kind of specification. This could be test cases, it could be also a formal specification. And then you have an analyzer, this could be a model checker that tests the formal specification against your system, or it could be something that executes tests. And then you would get an answer whether your implementation is correct or incorrect with respect to that specification that you have provided. Um, but there is another approach. So this would be the, the verification approach. And then there is also the synthesis approach. And this is what we will look at now. The idea here is that um, we don't want to do the implementation ourselves. We want the computer to do this. So now we need a synthesizer. We give a specification to the synthesizer, and then we receive an implementation. So the main difference is usually that the specifications are declarative. So we just say what we want the system to do, but we don't say how it should do it. That's usually the implementation. But um, instead of providing the implementation ourselves, we just want the implementation to be created by the computer. Um, yeah, and this is what we will look at. And this this arrow here, you see up here, we said this is a correctness assertion, but here we actually have a correct by construction. So if this process and all its steps work out well, um, then our implementation will be correct by construction. It will satisfy the specification, which is very nice. Um, it's a nice, nice thing, but um, so if we characterize Reactive synthesis is an automated procedure to obtain a correct by construction reactive system directly from the temporal specification. So the, the really attractive thing about this is that it's correct by construction. So we give a specification, we get a, a correct system. Um, but the bad thing about this is that reactive synthesis is usually 
computationally expensive and there are a few other issues with it, but uh, recent work maybe in the last 10 years um, has demonstrated that still reactive synthesis may be applicable to medium-sized systems. There are some uh, yeah, quite big advances and we will look at some that have made this, uh, this work also possible. And our focus was to look at the software engineering aspects in this new era of, of synthesis. So the idea is we take synthesis as a given. So we imagine a world where synthesis is given and then what would the software engineering look like in this new world? So what languages would we use? It will no longer be programming languages and also what would be the engineer's tasks? This will also be different because now we are basically shifting from code to specifications and the main artifacts that the engineers will write, read, analyze, debug, fix and evolve will be specifications and not the code. So over the, the last many, many decades, we have as a yeah, community or as a whole in computer science, developed a lot of experience, knowledge and tools to work with code, to read code, to analyze code, debug, fix and evolve, but not so much for specifications. And this is the gap that this project is trying to start uh, to fill. So let's look at a very simple example of, of one of the kind of specifications that we look at in this, in this project. So here is a system. Um, it's a reactive system that controls the traffic lights on this, this kind of merging intersection. We have two lanes. Um, cars can come on any of the two lanes and well there is some issue if both cars would have a green light at the same time there might be crashes so there are some uh, constraints that we want to be satisfied by the implementation of the system but the, the very first step um, what we see here now this is a specification in the specification language that we have developed as part of this project um, the first thing you need to do is you need to say what are the um, possible inputs that, that the system can sense. So for example, we can sense whether a car is on this lane and whether a car is on that lane. So these would be Boolean inputs, whether a car is there or not. And then uh, what is the thing that the system can control? So we can control whether the light here is green and whether the, or whether the light over there is green um, independently. And you see here this uh, environment, this is basically the description of everything outside the system. So we cannot control whether there is a car or not, but we can control whether we turn on the green light or not. And then um, we, want, we need to characterize behaviors of the environment. So this would be using assumptions. So we can assume that maybe in the initial state, there is no car present, but then, always eventually, so after a finite amount of time, we will see a car on lane A, and then the same goes for lane B. So always eventually we will also see um, a car on lane B. And then we have to write some, some guarantees. So very, very typical guarantees. I mean, this is a very small toy example, but, but very typical. You have these safety guarantees that always, we never have the green lights on together. Um, so this always would refer to any, um, any point in time. And then we also have some typical liveness guarantees here that always eventually a car is there and is allowed to pass with the green light. Otherwise uh, there might be very trivial implementations, for example, that always turn both lights red, then we never have green together, but that's not a very interesting um, implementation then. So this would be one of these kind of systems and, and the, what the specification would look like. Um, and more general, we need to look at what is the meaning of this specification. So we saw, well, we have inputs, outputs, we have assumptions, we have guarantees, but what does it really mean in terms of the implementation that we are looking at? So GR1 is a, an assumed guarantee fragment and GR1 of LTL and GR1 is the the semantics basis of, of our synthesis language um, and the realizability of a GR1 problem can be defined as an LTL formula over environment controlled and system controlled variables. And this is a 
slight simplification, but we basically say when the uh, all the initial assumptions hold and at any point in time, so this is now the LTL operator globally, the um, safety assumptions hold and then uh, the liveness assumptions always eventually, so infinitely many times also hold, then the system needs to make sure that all the guarantees are also satisfied. So basically, if the assumptions are satisfied, our implementation must satisfy the guarantees. Um, this dependence between assumptions and guarantees makes, makes some sense because in, in an environment where your assumptions do not hold, it might be impossible to, to satisfy your, your guarantees. Um, and for this fragment, there exist some symbolic fixed point algorithms, which are quadratic in the state space. So um, when these, these algorithms were, were developed, uh, people very soon started to, to like them a lot because of the, um, the quadratic complexity of the algorithm, or well, quadratic in the state space, which is still exponential in the number of variables, but, but still uh, it's much better than LTL synthesis because in LTL synthesis you have um, double exponential complexity in the length of the formula. So this is one of the efficient fragments for synthesis, uh, which basically made uh, yeah, a lot of progress in this area possible. And this is what maybe a controller would look like. So such an implementation, it's basically a, um, here a, a melee machine where you have states, you have inputs on transitions, and then you have outputs on transitions, and then you go to the next state. And the idea of a controller is that it would be uh, complete for everything that the environment can do, and it would be deterministic for things that the system wants to do. So you have given any kind of environment, if it gives inputs, then uh, the system will always be able to produce outputs. And the combination of all these inputs and outputs will satisfy the, the specification or the, the LTL semantics of the specification. Um, yeah. And if we look at some example specific applications that we have uh, developed or that others have developed with us over uh, the previous years, then uh, we started out with some Lego robots and other simulation. So we ran some project classes where it was like a software development project one semester where the students would not write a lot of code, but they would write a specification instead. Um, so teams of students, they use Spectra, our specification language, to develop and run simple applications like these Lego robots and other uh, simulations. And the important thing is that we were teaching Spectra like we would teach Java. So we teach the syntax and the semantics by example with hands-on practice and not necessarily telling people about LTL and this is the semantics in terms of um, yeah, formal, formal logic. Um, we didn't tell them all about binary decision diagrams and fixed point algorithms, but really as, as if somebody would learn a programming language, uh, this way we were trying to teach the students um, this, this new method of, of developing systems. Um, and these are some of the systems that the students developed. So color sort of robot where all the behavior was uh, completely synthesized. The inputs would be sensors um, for different colored uh, buckets, and then a sensor for the color of the current Lego brick, uh, different sensors for possible inputs to change the behavior. And then the outputs would be commands that you can that the robot can give to the motors to move the arm between different buckets to push in the next um, Lego brick and to deliver it using this uh, small uh, conveyor belt or um, the control of a of an elevator things like this they they are all reactive systems um, where the the behavior at the future might depend on on something that happens right now or happened in the past so you need some kind of um, yeah, relation, temporal relation between inputs and outputs. Then others were uh, more on the simulation area, which would be a smart home system, for example. The inputs are the different sensors, and, and then the outputs would be, for example, the lights or the music, uh, things like that, that the smart home can control. Uh, another example would be an airport, an air traffic uh, control simulation. 
and there you might have um, some assumptions on um, on weather conditions, how long it might be foggy or that it's not always foggy, things like that. That might be yeah, assumptions that you need. And then you have some guarantees, for example, that the number of, of airplanes on the, on the runway has a certain limit and that in certain weather conditions, um, you even need to further restrict the number of, of airplanes in the air and yeah, things like that. Um, then other maybe more small scale examples where you can write specifications really quickly. This would be, for example, these kind of simple robots, which are based on some Arduino or Raspberry Pi chips. Um, this we used also in, in Leicester for teaching in a, in a master's module on, on generative development and, and wrap this in, in a nice uh, yeah, small framework. Um, so all of these systems and all of these examples, uh, they are available on somewhere on, on GitHub or on the Syntec uh, project page. The, the links will also be uh, on, on later slides here. So in terms of the, the, the specifications that were written by the students, so you can imagine that writing a specification over a time of one semester, so multiple months, many iterations, uh, you get quite substantial specifications. So if you would have students write code, they would have many hundreds lines of code. But actually, the interesting thing is that the specifications stayed somewhat small. Um, could be many, many reasons. Um, for example, maybe it's more succinct to describe these kind of systems, or maybe the systems were, were too simple. But you can you can see that um, basically the, um, the complexity is not extremely large, but also not, not very simple. So the specifications, they were describing something like more than 40 Boolean variables after translation. So you would not always have to describe things in terms of Boolean variables, but higher level uh, constructs that then boil down to Boolean variables. Um, so this, this means that the state space would be something like here, two to the 40 possible different states or two to the 70 uh, different states even that the system could be in, potentially. Um, the specifications, they usually had around something like 10 assumptions, 20 guarantees. Uh, some went up to 30 guarantees. There were many uh, language features which are not native to GR1 uh, that we introduced and, and that were used a lot. Um, and I will give an overview of some of these language features um, soon. And the synthesis time for these kind of specifications, they were usually less than a minute on, a, on an ordinary laptop. Um, actually, in the first year that we ran this, so something like five years ago, they easily lasted up to an hour uh, before students got, got tired of it. Uh, so we did a lot of improvements also performance-wise. So now all the specifications we have, they, they synthesize really fast. Um, the controllers that are synthesized, so they have something like yeah, 10,000 or, or more reachable states. And now the, the difference here between, I don't know, 2 to the 70 and um, yeah, just 10,000. 10, the difference is that simply um, once you are inside a controller executing, um, the system makes sure that not so many states are visited because many states are not necessary for the correct function of the, of the system. So the theoretically visible, uh, visitable states, reachable states are not really necessary. Um, but still having controllers this size is um, not so easy to handle. And we, we needed to represent them in symbolic ways. And, and recently, there's uh, also some, some work on uh, symbolic just-in-time synthesis, um, because even the symbolic representation had some issues with, uh, with size. Um, all these specifications, they're available from the Syntec website. And this is actually also something that never really has been there before and that was created by, by this project. This is actually the availability of specifications that have been created by people using synthesis uh, technologies. So now um, many other competitors or people who are working on different parts of, of synthesis, different aspects of synthesis, they are actually looking for our specifications because it's the first time that we really have uh, human created uh, large numbers of specifications available for, for synthesis. Um, and if we look at the development process, yes, you might say these systems are not very large, but 
yeah, they're also not very small, not trivial, um, and they have to interact with the environment in complex ways. So this is the, the main aspect, I think, um, that you have a complex interaction. So if you would have a more traditional development approach, you would have to implement maybe the systems in some programming language and then still verify the correctness using some tools. So you would still have to write maybe a specification uh, to make sure that your system really satisfies uh, certain requirements. Um, so yeah, manual implementation, and you would probably still want some formal specification because you don't want uh, your elevator to get stuck or your planes to crash just because somebody forgot a case. And yeah. So now let's look at the specification language. Um, the spectra, so this, this language is built on top of a kernel language, which is very close to the, the GA1 fragment. Um, so basically just Boolean environment and system variables, and then assumptions and guarantees that can describe the initial states, that can describe the current states and the possible transitions, and then the justice or, or yeah, more general liveness um, assumptions and guarantees that describe things that need to happen always eventually, so after some, some finite time or infinitely many times on, infinite, on any infinite run. And the semantics of this kernel language, it's almost immediately mapped directly to this GO1 synthesis fragment. Um, but it's not really practical to write large and complex specifications using this kernel. Um, so what we did is we extended this kernel with more higher level concepts um, to allow us to basically reuse things uh, to make the, the writing of specifications more succinct and also more readable. So for example, yeah, instead of just using Boolean variables, you might want enumeration data types, you might want some bounded integers, plus some suitable arithmetic, um, maybe arrays, and also once you have arrays and things like that, you might want quantification over, over the array fields. You have to see that here, everything must be declarative. So it's not like you have a for loop or anything in this language. So something like uh, quantification might be something like a for loop in, in, a, um, yeah, in, in this declarative way. Other things that sometimes come in handy is counters where uh, you're able to count the occurrence of something over, uh, over time then simply defines for reusing more, more complex expressions. Monitors, they are a little bit similar to counters, but they can, they can basically have uh, yeah, different, different kinds of states and, and, um, and say in which state we're currently in. Um, so they are mainly readable. Um, and then also yeah, parameterized predicates and other, other extensions, these are all extensions that we did to the language to make writing specifications a little bit more, more easy. And the importance is that we have defined the semantics of each of these constructs um, based on a translation to the spectra kernel language, basically. So this way we can make sure that we can still use the same synthesis algorithms because the semantics of the kernel was defined in terms of GA1, which where we have the available synthesis algorithms. So what we did is we tried to break down all of these language extensions always uh, to the kernel language. And here is some example of, of these more high level constructs. So we can have a definition of a constant um, here. The number um, N would be the, the, the value eight. Um, and then we can define Boolean arrays. So this is the, the traffic light, but now with multiple lanes. So now we have maybe eight lanes um, and eight traffic lights. And then if we want to say that initially there is no car in any lane, we could use this um, quantification here and simply have an initial constraint that uh, yeah, quantifies over all of the possible uh, indices of that array. We can also nest the, the quantification. So if we want to say that um, if that the that we always should have a green light if a car is in uh, the the matching lane, uh, then we would we could put this with a nested quantification. 
Um, and here is another example of, of one of these language features. This would be a counter. We want to count the number of green lights until we need um, some, some maintenance cycle. So the counter would be, so all the integers have to be bounded in, in spectra. So here, uh, this would be the bound from, from zero to uh, the number of, of cycles. Um, then we can define initial values and then also predicates of when to increase, when to decrease the, the counter, how it should handle overflows. Um, and then we can use the counter as if it was a normal integer. So we can do all the things with the counter that we could do with integers. Um, we can, for example, check, well, here, equality with uh, another integer. So uh, the arithmetic on bounded integers, it's maybe a bit tricky, but um, yeah, it's it's something to, to easily get used to. And um, we're not bound to basically only comparing integers of the same um, of the same intervals. So you have the full flexibility of, of comparing integers. Some are then trivially false because you can never have uh, equality, for example, between integers on, on disjoint intervals. But yeah, um, all this is taken care of by the language and by or by the tools behind the language. And as the developer, you don't have to, to care about this. Um, now, there are some a little bit more, more tricky language extensions. Um, so there is a, a popular uh, set of, of LTL specification patterns that were identified um, in, in specifications in, in model checking, and those were given in, in LTL. And now the question, or maybe a, a good question would be, can we use them also for synthesis? The problem is that these are specified in LTL and that we only have GA1. So the question is, how do we get from LTL to GA1? And it's the, the answer is it's, it's not possible uh, to always do this, but there are some cases where it works. Um, so we extended the language to allow the definition of patterns. But then what we also wanted to do is we wanted to use the, an existing library of, of patterns and see whether we can get it to the GA1 fragment. And um, we actually found out that of the popular wire patterns, we can support 52 out of 55 of the patterns by um, yeah, going, taking the, the LTL, translating it to deterministic buki, buki automata, then minimizing them, um, and then translating them to, to the GA1 fragment. So um, this translation step is quite expensive. But the nice thing is, because we have this, this library uh, concept embedded in the spectra language, that you have to do this translation, this expensive one that might fail. You only have to do it once. And then you have, a with this approach, minimal representation of the, the pattern, and you can put it in your library. So we are now uh, supplying the library of Dwyer patterns, um, except for the three that are not possible to translate to a um, deterministic Buki automaton. So there you would need a non-deterministic Buki automaton, which then, yeah, you can't put into, uh, into the GR1 fragment. Um, so now you simply import those, those Dwyer patterns or other libraries. And you can instantiate the patterns with any Boolean uh, expressions. So anything that evaluates to Boolean can be the, uh, the parameters of these um, patterns. And there were already uh, some others who have, for example, created these, these patterns for, um, for robots, robot mission planning. Um, so basically, I think it's, it's robots moving in maybe two dimensions or yeah, something like that. And they, they then check whether um, all these patterns satisfy the same criterion as, as here. So whether it um, we would be possible to support them with uh, GR1 synthesis. Um, that's also one of the applications where people have been using GR1 synthesis. This would be mission planning. Um, some, yeah, some other groups have, have done this. Um, but the language is basically uh, no good without tools that, that allow you to use the language um, efficiently and effectively. And the main tool that you would want 
to start with is the synthesizer, of course. You have written your nice specifications, um, then you want to check for realizability, and if your specification is realizable, you would like to have um, a controller synthesized for it, right? So um, the realizability checking for GR1, uh, because we reduce everything to the GR1 fragment, this follows the symbolic fixed point algorithms um, described by um, yeah by the by the people who created this this year one fragment, then uh, we're using the BDD library CUDD as a backend with some performance heuristics that we have implemented. And um, for the controller construction, we started out with concrete outputs. So what we were in the first year, what we were trying to to generate is is Java code because we thought well on these robots we can we can run Java virtual machines. So Let's just synthesize uh, Java output, and then we noticed uh, very quickly into the semester that the Java compiler has a limitation on the size of the uh, Java files that it can compile, and that if our controllers get large enough, then we are exceeding this this limitation. So we needed to find solutions, and and one of the solutions is a symbolic output. So instead of um, having the, the concrete code that reads the, the sensors and based on each possible input, it creates the possible output of the current next state. Um, based on that, we can represent the controller in a more like a, a logic formula way where you, where you give uh, the inputs and then you can evaluate it for possible um, possible outputs. So this is the symbolic representation where you simply have a binary decision diagram or yeah, simply a, a formula where you can plug in the inputs and then um, you ask it what are possible outputs that that you can um, that you can complete this to be a valid uh, computation step. And this is what we implemented then and still this leads to some performance issues. Uh, so the synthesis can then still be um, a little bit slow and well back then um, with without many of the high level language features nobody noticed but as the language features grew uh, the demand for performance was was growing and and then last year I think um, a student in, in Tel Aviv also uh, came up with this just in time synthesis where you don't even create this this formula um, directly but uh, do it on the fly so there's some pre pre-synthesis and then you have the, the the real synthesis that you do during the execution so this way we we can scale again for the next uh, for the next few uh, things that you want to put in your specification um, and we also noticed that we need a lot more uh, analysis so we don't just need the synthesis and checking whether a specification is realizable because at some point you run into for example unrealizability or other quality issues of your specifications, and then you would want uh, help with that. So this is like, uh, yeah, if you have an IDE, the IDE doesn't just have a compiler uh, in your programming language, it has all kinds of other features that allow you to analyze your, your code. Um, and, and the same is required for specifications. So here we can see an overview of the, the framework that we have created in the beginning, um, when we came up with this component-based architecture, uh, we thought, wow, do we really need to make it that complex um, and so many layers? But yes, we, we kind of do. So um, the input here, this is the specification language that we have developed, but there are other uh, specification languages. So we have um, the option to simply replace the, the specification language um, and then still go to our kind of abstract syntax representation which has support for all the nice language features. Then we can break it down to a um, BDD-based representation, which is basically this, this kind of GO1 kernel. Um, on this level, we can solve the, the synthesis problem. And then here we can solve more advanced analysis problems. And we have UIs for all these tools. Um, so there are different, different layers where, where other people can plug into this and, and extend this. Um, yeah, recently we had someone who wanted just to generate spectra code to then use the whole pipeline. So they would basically plug in here. Others, they wanted to um, use our specifications 
and um, use them for their own synthesis tool. So basically, they would plug in here because um, that's where we have simplified and broken down everything to the kernel. So yeah, this this complexity in uh, in, a, in a tool um, is somehow yeah necessary, and I think it, it helped us a lot in the development uh, of this to be somewhat um, yeah modular. Okay, but let's look at two of the main uh, maybe interesting or or obvious uh, analysis methods that we need. So some specifications are simply unrealizable. There's no controller implementation that can promise that all the runs of it will satisfy the specification. And that's not good. So whenever, um, so this is basically a very, very tough requirement that whenever the assumptions are satisfied, we need to satisfy all the guarantees. And sometimes that's not possible. Um, and it turns out that this problem is quite common. So I think um, we, we did some observation of, of students writing specifications. And I think a third of the specifications you write as soon as they get some complexity, a third is uh, simply um, unrealizable. So the analysis will tell you, sorry, I can't find an implementation. So one of the, the very simple examples that I, I think I also mentioned uh, in, in, in a workshop uh, at the TAS or hands meeting was simply um, we had a, a robot and it was supposed to, to drive around and it was supposed to not hit a wall. So very, very simple requirement. And then um, what happened is that the, the synthesis told us, sorry, I can't implement this. There's no way I can, I can move the motors uh, to ensure that I'm not going to bump into a wall. And, and we thought, well, that's, that's really strange. And then we asked the system to explain why and the system explained. And the explanation that the system gave us basically showed uh, the robot, then a wall comes, the robot tries to go backwards, uh, and the wall simply follows the robot and blocks the sensor. So um, this is an example of an unrealizable specification where we simply forgot to put in the assumption that walls don't move. Um, so this is something that you easily forget, uh, because if you just write code and not specifications, you you know this, that walls don't move. The, the person who writes the code knows this. Uh, so this is kind of this implicit knowledge. Um, and in synthesis, you have to make this implicit knowledge explicit, because otherwise, the controller can't just guess. Uh, the, the, comp the computer can't just guess. The synthesizer needs to know uh, what walls do, for example. Um, yeah, so in Inspector Tools, we have implemented uh, a few ways to deal with unrealizability. And um, we will look at some examples right now. So here we have a specification of the traffic light extended with an ambulance. Um, and we say, well, if all the time, if the ambulance is there on lane B, then uh, the lane needs to be green. Now, it turns out that this specification, uh, this, this extended specification is um, unrealizable. Um, might be a bit easy to see, but uh, if we run our analysis, it can give us an unrealizable core. So an unrealizable core is a minimal subset of guarantees that together already are unrealizable. So they are together already in a conflict. And here, it's a very easy conflict to see. Um, initially, none of the lanes is allowed to have a green light. But uh, if an ambulance comes in the initial state, then um, the, the light needs to be green. So there we have a contradiction between two guarantees. So that's maybe uh, maybe an easy case to find, um, but still it helps to narrow it down using these unrealizable cores. So um, it's locally minimal. As soon as we remove one of these, then uh, the, the remaining will, will be realizable. Um, but yeah, here is, so now we, we are, Kind of fixing this, we say, well, add, add as an assumption that there is no ambulance um, in lane B and in the initial state. And still, we have a problem. And now, let's again calculate the core. Now, this core already has four guarantees. So basically, if you kick out one of these guarantees, then the remaining three allow you to realize to find an implementation. But these four alone will not allow you to find an implementation. And here, it's a, it's a bit more tricky. Um, so 
what we can do is we can look at a counter strategy. So this is how does the environment try to force us um, to violate our guarantees? Now this counter strategy is, yeah, again, a bit difficult to, to, to get the, the meaning of. So here we can, um, this is the work we did to um, find the structures in these kind of counter strategies to, to visualize um, what the environment can actually do. So we see that from the initial state, we could get into a uh, cycle where we can never ensure that we have a, a car that passes on, on with a green light on the road A. And the reason simply is that um, the ambulance always overrides that we have a, a green light here. But um, you see that we also have infinitely many car A's coming and car B's. So what the and and we have this assumption that we don't always have an ambulance. So the the complex counter strategy here, what it does is um, it puts a car A only together with an ambulance. So then car A can never pass because uh, with a, if an ambulance is there, it needs to be uh, green on B. Um, we satisfy all the assumptions because there are infinitely many car A's um, and there are infinitely many car B's afterwards. Uh, but A can never pass because it always happens with an ambulance. And ambulances are not infinitely many because we can switch to these. So very complex uh, things. And, and we can uh, basically zoom into these nodes and then get explanation or get uh, the more relevant parts of the counter strategy that, that basically show us what happens in these nodes of this um, counter strategy graph. Um, then there is another interesting issue that we discovered. Um, so unrealizability, this was known for, for a long time. There, there were, were similar tools, but there's another thing um, which is not so common. So here we have a maintenance signal. And we say if, uh, if, the, if the system says that the uh, traffic light is under maintenance, then there shouldn't be uh, a car at lane A. So now um, what happens, we run the synthesizer um, and it turns out that this one is realizable. So we're happy, we got our implementation. But then suddenly we have some cars crashing and we see that uh, the system can actually turn on the green light on both lanes together, which doesn't make sense because there is a guarantee that says it doesn't. Uh, now there is a special case called non-well separation. This is when the system is able to force the environment to violate assumptions. And as soon as assumptions are violated, the system no longer has to satisfy the guarantees. So this is kind of a uh, yeah, malicious implementation that we don't really want. So what we developed is uh, some tools to find this and, and the way that, it, that, the system, uh, can, that the system can force the environment to violate assumptions is by simply saying, oh, I'm in a maintenance state. Then in this case here, um, there can't be any car coming on A. So if we do this all the time, uh, then the system, uh, the, the environment will have to violate the assumption that we have always eventually a car coming. And we have developed tools to, to handle this, uh, to address this similar to unrealizability. Um, and yeah, we can detect this, we can compute again cores and we can compute strategies that, that demonstrate uh, how the system can do this bad thing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this would be the non-world separated core here. So yeah, we have packaged all the spectra tools in an engineering uh, engineer friendly user interface inside Eclipse. The source code is available on GitHub. We have uh, many examples and a user guide on and, and the specifications on the Syntec website. We have video tutorials that we did as part of an ICSI technical briefing, uh, and they're all available with code on, on GitHub. Um, and now it's just a quick, uh, in the last few minutes, it's just a quick outlook of what's next. So um, there are some things that Spectra doesn't do right now. Um, so for example, Spectra only deals with discrete and bounded data types. There's nothing about real numbers, and we only have 
a finite state space. There's no support for real-time properties, anything like that. We have extensions of spectra with, um, with some quantitative properties, um, but they are, yeah, they, they are somewhat different. They'll be published in a, in a, in a few months. Um, they'll appear. Um, and we also don't deal with uncertainty and probabilities in synthesis. So this is really about the, the control and the, the temporal um, control of, of systems. And the, the synthesizer finds a solution, but it's not always necessarily an optimal one. For example, in the number of states or distances between justice sedges, uh, factions. There are some works that we have done in these areas, but this is so far, we haven't really touched these, these topics. Um, but it doesn't mean that they are uh, here. It says current limitations. So it doesn't mean that these things are, are impossible. So if somebody's really interested in, in one of these topics and needs them, uh, then, then we can look into this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then on the language and analysis tools front, so we have quite a few language features. Uh, the question is, do we need more analysis? So I think what, what we need right now is more experience in order to prioritize possible extensions. So what language features are used and how uh, are the tools that we have effective enough? Um, and for example, the cores, counter strategies, are they helpful, are they used? So we are looking for users and collaborators to advance uh, Spectra. And similarly, in the applications domain, um, the tools currently are domain agnostic, which we did on, on purpose. Um, but there are maybe some domain-specific example applications where you might want to use a different input language or domain-specific language maybe, and then you can compile it to Spectra, things like that. Uh, they might be quite interesting. So we started some um, collaboration with industrial partners in the fields of uh, robotic mission orchestration, but we are still uh, yeah, looking for more users and collaborators to, to try our tools um, in, in different domains. Um, yeah, this is an overview of the, the publications on yeah, quality issues, language, expressiveness, and, uh, and performance. OK, now. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, we have time for questions. So let's see whether there are any questions from the audience. I could have started with one and then hopefully more questions will come. So one thing that um, is very interesting for us in the verifiability node, and I guess um, could be interesting for synthesis, is looking at evolving specifications like if uh, someone writes a specification and then later on corrects it because it was unrealizable, or even if you have synthesized um, a, a controller from a specification and later on you change the specification, you don't want to redo everything anew. So uh, have you looked into that problem? Is this among one of these publications listed here? Or um, So we have on, on this call, I think Zeyu was, was here on this call. So in, in Leicester, we started to look at the the comparison of specifications. So you do a change to a specification, you want to kind of understand um, what, what happened to the, the meaning of your specification, to the semantics, what, what is the impact of that change. So we, we have started working on some heuristics um, there to analyze that. We haven't published it yet. It also is very, it's quite interesting because the to, to basically compare the, the specifications, you need something more than, uh, even LTL, and you need something more than than GR1 because you want to talk about um, the difference in possible environments. So it's not that they are different in in any environment; they are different only in maybe some possible environments. So there might be some out inputs uh, and outputs over time that make them different. So um, we are working on on detecting this, uh, but it's yeah, it's not so it's not so easy, and the complexity of the analysis will probably be quite yeah quite high. Uh, we looked at also incremental synthesis. So basically, um, when you when you change part of your specification, then um, maybe you can use previous or partial previous results to synthesize the next controller because it might be still similar to the previous one. So that, that way you could also ensure that you have maybe only small changes. Um, this only works for some possible ways. So you have assumptions and you have guarantees and basically adding 
and, and you have different types of guarantees and assumptions. So basically adding um, some guarantees allows you to restart a, like a, a fixed point computation just with the additional guarantees because you know that um, the new set of states will simply be smaller. So then, then it's, it's possible based on what fixed point you're calculating. So it's a bit tricky. There are three nested fixed points and they behave in the, in the GR1 synthesis and they behave somewhat differently um, whether you strengthen or weaken assumptions. So there are only very, very special cases where you can actually reuse um, parts of these in, in synthesis. Yeah. Is there any scope to change the synthesis uh, uh, structure so so that it becomes more amenable to to changes? So maybe a bit less efficient, but but uh, but more amenable to changes. I mean, there are well, there are there are some. For example, mm, I mean, I think in in general, the the overall structure um, of the the synthesis algorithm you can't really change because the it's, it's dictated by the semantics of the assumptions and guarantees. So changing something there, yeah, might be might be tricky. There are some people who have looked at uh, reuse in, let's say, very very special cases where um, where some liveness describes a single state. So where basically uh, every time you want to satisfy a liveness guarantee, you have to visit that exact state. And then it becomes a bit easier because you know that everything needs to go through that state no matter what. But um, usually a liveness guarantee can be any kind of expression, so it can characterize sets of states. And then you don't know what state exactly you have to go through. So there are some, some variants that people have looked into, but then these are kind of yeah, degenerated uh, like specifications. So. The interesting thing might be that for some domains, um, you would you would have only a subset of the, the 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 language features needed, and then you have these special cases. So, for example, um, there was a, uh, a student from another university kind of compiling some natural language processing down to spectra specifications, um, and and this student only used the the safety fragment, so without any liveness, and then uh, the everything becomes much simpler in terms of the algorithms. So there you would immediately have um, many more opportunities to, to simplify things and make things iterative, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? I don't see any hands raised. Oh, there is a question in the chat box. Let me get to the chat box. So Adi Reza is writing, I have a question. Is there possible to synthesize an artificial neural network as a controller? I guess that would be a different type of synthesis, uh, not, not really a logical synthesis, but yes. Yeah, uh, I, I wonder, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if, um, so basically um, you, you have this, the, the controllers usually have some kind of, a little bit of state or, or memory that they know uh, what is the current, what, what has happened in the past and, and what do I need to do in the future? So the, the question is how there are probably some um, artificial neural networks that have feedback and then can keep that state in their execution. Um, and I think that maybe there are some groups that have tried to, to work on this, um, but I wonder what the, the benefits and, and challenges are. So the one, one challenge is um, that maybe you lose the, uh, the guarantee of, of correctness by construction. I'm not 100% sure if you can easily guarantee that for um, other technologies other than this um, yeah, symbolic representation. Um, so maybe you lose something there. Um, yeah. But there are different ways, so you don't have to synthesize everything using GR1. Uh, there are, uh, for example, there's bounded synthesis where people use uh, SNT solvers to uh, to encode the structure of a possible controller, and then uh, they encode uh, maybe bounded ways of of satisfying the liveness and safety. And if you if your bound is large enough, you you eventually find a controller if if, if one exists. So um, there are definitely other ways to 
find controllers for the same kind of specification that are not necessarily based on um, symbolic representations using BDDs. So yeah, and, and other people have, I think, started to evaluate this, for example, because the, the, the nice thing is that we are the ones who created yeah, human written specifications. And, and this, before that, it, it simply, before this project, it simply didn't exist. There were some example systems that, that were written by some researchers, um, but you never had a large body of specifications that is diverse um, and, and different iterations and things like that. So some people have used these um, specifications completely outside of our synthesis tool chain to yeah to 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 explore new technologies uh, so maybe maybe if you're interested in uh, in this like I can uh, help you read our specifications programmatically and then you can try try this out thank you very much uh, are there